is the video I've been talking about doing for years now. And it is basically how I got into the whole goth thing in Norway. Because uh, recently there's been a few videos about how people would do things in the 90s pre-internet. And my take on the whole thing is both, kind of. Mostly online, but also kind of offline. And I'll try to explain that in this video. Because it occurred to me that my approach to the whole goth scene thing might be slightly different than most people. And also because I live in such a small country, we were kind of limited in a way, especially in my own town, uh, which made things more difficult. So this is late 90s, early 2000s, my teen years. Yes. Um, I've prepared notes for once and I've prepared a playlist of songs that would be kind of like my soundtrack uh, in my teens and early 20s. And over the course of this video, I hope to get through all of my points, because there are a lot. And yeah. So first of all, a bit of a backstory. Um, I found this map right here. As you can see, I labeled and circled a few cities on it. Uh, <clears throat> I chose this map because it has miles in addition to kilometers. And that helps in illustrating the distances I had to travel if I were to get anything done. So, I grew up in Trondheim. And as you can see, it's a bit far away from where the things happened. So I had to do other things. I had to figure out how to find information. I had to do a lot of it online because that was my only real chance. And the reason for that is because I was a teenager, the very few select goth events that were happening in my hometown, I couldn't get into. I was too young. I just couldn't get in. So what I would do is usually go online and in the very very beginning it was primarily IRC uh, Internet Relay Chat. It's kind of like a multi-user MSN Messenger type deal. And I would talk to people who were I don't know four, five, maybe six years older than I am and they identified as you know, goth or whatever, and they they let me ask them questions. And they would explain several things, <laughs> and uh, I would try to do my own research, and, you know, I should note that it took me about, well, a better chunk of 15 years, bef like between the time I was kind of introduced to a uh, darker, like, the book series I've talked about before, Little Vampire, when I was about eight. And until I was about in my early 20s, when I wouldn't really protest if people were calling me a goth, but I didn't say I was one either. So it's kind of like, I didn't say I was one, I didn't deny I was one. So people kind of assumed I was, and I just kind of went with it after a while. So, yeah. Another reason is that my parents didn't want me hanging out downtown at night. So, even if there were local kids who dressed as goth in my city, which I knew, I, I'd seen them around, um, I couldn't get to know them because I couldn't go into the city by myself at night because my mom and my dad didn't let me. And that's why I just ended up sitting in front of the computer all day at night. But, I think some of the things I ended up doing, or ended up being able to do, maybe even helped me in a way. And I'll get to that in a, in a while. <laughs> yeah. So, and another point is that 
the underground music scene in my hometown, it wasn't very goth oriented, it wasn't even very punk oriented, even though we had like a, um, it's a youth driven <clears throat> house called Uffa. At least it was when I was growing up, I don't know if it exists anymore, but I think it does. Um, and they would have a lot of shows, they would have like punk, metal, <clears throat> everything in between. But the majority of the underground music scene when I was growing up, in my teen years, were mostly emo and screamo type things. So even like everyone just attended the same shows anyway. And I've said this before, like goths went to the metal shows with the punks and the metalheads and the emos and screamos and all these kids and the emos and screamos came to the punk shows and metalheads came to the goth shows. It was kind of everyone just kind of went to each other's things all the time. So <clears throat> I kind of fell backwards into goth music through metal and there's a reason for that and I'll just get to that in one moment because what would constitute goth music or goth appropriate bands when I was growing up at the time and in my home city anyway or hometown were not your typical 80s goth bands. Uh, I have a little list here so Nearly everyone I talked to who identified as a goth said they would listen to Smashing Pumpkins. That was like one of the big ones. <clears throat> Smashing Pumpkins and also Him, Lacuna Coil, Tiamat, The Six Nine Eyes, Typo Negative and things kind of like in that vein. You're like 90s-ish goth rock. Also, there's uh, there was a band in Norway called Seymen, uh, which was a huge, huge thing in the goth scene. And they kind of almost disbanded right when I was getting into the that sort of music, so I kind of fell off the whole bandwagon with that. Uh, other bands, and the reason I fell backwards into goth in the first place, would be... Uh, black metal bands like Dimmu Borgir and Cradle of Filth. When I was growing up, uh, <laughs> it was Dimmu Borgir and Cradle of Filth were kind of like the Marilyn Manson of my time. You weren't supposed to like them or listen to them because they were sellouts and too poppy for the true metalheads, but everyone did anyway. So, uh, they had, or at least some of their music did, and for the most part, the aesthetic of Cradle of Filth would be more towards the goth end than the metal end. So that led to me also listening to things like Nightwish, Sonata Arctica, and things like that, which is like, you know, things like Nightwish, uh, Taria era Nightwish, mind you. And then you had the industrial end of things. Uh, Nine Inch Nails was a big one, uh, also Rammstein, Rob Zombie, and a band called Covenant, which was kind of funny because the two first albums from Covenant are very, very black metal, and the two s other albums, the two later albums, are very, very industrial metal, so <laughs> they're kind of just split evenly between the camps, because that was a thing. Uh, the only real difference between goths in at least my home city but also I'm thinking my home country because it seemed to be the same thing everywhere was that you either preferred the uh, rock and metal aspect of it or you preferred the industrial and synth based uh, EBM type things the various Batcave, Death Rock, and Horror Punk bands were also mentioned, but it was usually more like, uh, oh, by the way, these are the old bands that these new bands are inspired by, and you should listen to these old bands as well. So it's kind of like just 
as a bit of a in passing mention <laughs> as opposed to you have to listen to all these great bands. So yeah, th that was kind of interesting because it seems like now at least it's the other way around. You get introduced to all the old bands and then you kind of find your way forward in history, if that makes any sense. And we just did everything backwards, <laughs> so yeah. And <clears throat> a second point on that whole thing with uh, the split between rock and industrial-based music for Goths in Norway. Uh, whether you prefer the rock or metal end or the industrial end, it didn't matter. You listened to both. You just had a preference. And then we have things that happened when I was... Ooh, I forgot to double check. The very first comic was published in 1997 and this is the first collection book of several I have. I don't have all of them yet but I'm working on it because in 97 I was 12 or 13. Uh, yeah, it was the year I would turn 13 I think if memory serves and a few years after that this comic that I'm about to show you was like the comic if you were interested in anything relating to goth, metal, uh, to some extent punk, but anything that was like dark and spooky and dragons and unicorns and things like that, like I am, uh, you would automatically be labeled as a pretend or wannabe Nemi. It's one of my favorite comics. But because of this comic, anyone who said or said they were goth or anything, especially a goth, because she is portrayed as a por portrayed. Holy moly. Uh, she is portrayed as a goth girl, and in the comic strips, she'll have both metal band t-shirts on and also she'll feature things like Sisters of Mercy and Bauhaus and you know all the good old classics but because she looks the way looks the way she does with long black hair and fairly dark makeup anyone who said they were a goth would then be labeled as a wannabe nami and be ridiculed for that fact so I kind of just didn't say I was a goth when I was about you know 14 15 as most people get into it I was getting into it, and I was reading this a whole lot. And I was getting information from friends online, and I was researching things and getting a hold of um, websites and books and things I'm going to mention later at the time. But I didn't say I was a goth because I didn't want even more bullying because I was yet another freak. And that's the sad fact of things. I could have easily just said when I was like 15 that, well, yeah, I'm a goth. And then just went on from there. But no, I waited. And that's the Norwegian uh, comic book. That was like the huge thing here. And also, the graphic novels by Neil Gaiman of the Sandman series. This is also like a goth staple, especially in Norway. And a part of the reason for that is a lot of the goth kids were also nerds, myself included. Uh, on my list, there's certain things that would constitute a Norwegian goth. One of those things is being a fan of fantasy literature, such as Tolkien. If you read Lord of the Rings in high school, you were either a complete nerd or you were a gothy nerd, and people just kind of went with it. If you're familiar with Sandman at all, you probably are familiar with this character, Death. Which is basically the prototype of how a goth would look. 
in the early 90s, at least here in Norway. If you were a goth and you read Sandman, you looked like this. I looked like this. I still look like this. I only have longer hair. So yeah, that's basically like goth bible, if you will, in graphic novel form. In high school, I, for the most of the three years, I looked a lot like the main character in this comic. Uh, I looked like Enid from Ghost World. But this is not Ghost World, this is Wet Moon. And this is the first graphic novel in the series. And this character is Cleo. I had that haircut, I have glasses. I had glasses like this in high school as well. Uh, so I looked like this. And uh, on my graphic novels from this series it says Ross Campbell, but now the author and the illustrator of this is Sophie Campbell. So yeah, if you want to look him up, I think, I don't know if the, this will be reprinted under the correct name, but it's either Ross or Sophie Campbell. Or just Google Wet Moon. It is fan friggin' tastic. The main character is a college student, I think, if I remember correctly. And she lives in a house with like roommates and stuff. Yeah, here we go. You can kind of tell in this. And a lot of the artwork, when she's in her room and things, there's posters on the wall. And those of you with a keen eye will recognize this poster, or this logo, rather. I was reading this comic and all of a sudden I see a band name and I'm like, huh, that's a cool band name, I wonder if it's real. So I googled said band name and discovered Bella Morta. So these, these comics are the reason I discovered Bella Morta and became slightly obsessed with <laughs> with that band. It, it's my favorite modern goth band, hands down. That is one thing, like comics. The other big thing in Norway, at least when I was growing up, like when I was in, especially in high school, people who identified as a goth typically would gravitate towards uh, fantasy, sci-fi, and horror literature. Uh, things like that, you would be automatically categorized as a goth, no matter how you looked. So it was more of an internal thing for most of us, I think, in Norway. It was more about what kind of music we listened to, what books we would read, what comics we would read, and kind of our hobbies in general. And also, surprisingly, to some extent, TV shows. I would say that all the people I talked to in Norway who at one point or another in time identified as a goth watched Twin Peaks. Other movies that weren't really necessarily aimed at a goth audience but kind of ended up being a goth movie anyway were Donnie Darko, Ghost World, Requiem for a Dream, uh, and in all David Lynch movies, and of course Tim Burton movies, but that's the given. And The Matrix, for many, many people here in Norway, especially the industrial-oriented crowd, they would just go bananas over Matrix stuff. And then, of course, you had the Lord of the Rings movies that came out in theaters when I was a teenager. Good times. And then you have, um, like, the Blade series, the Underworld series, all of these movies started to come out in my teens. And then, of course, you had, like, the, it's like the older movies, like Interview with a Vampire. I think Queen of the Damned came out when I... I was about 16? 15, 16? I think so. And also, like, old black and white horror movies. Like Dracula and Frankenstein, all that stuff. It was just... you. That's what you were into. And here's the thing. 
I mentioned that the goth crowd and the nerd crowd were more or less the same people. Uh, if you were... <laughs> this is gonna make Nephilim laugh, I'm sure. If you were a Dungeons and Dragons nerd, you were most likely either a goth yourself, or a lot of your friends were goths. And this also applied to White Wolf, uh, like, I think Vampire the Masquerade is also White Wolf. I think. I'm not sure. Don't kill me. Um, but also any other tabletop gaming thing. That was like a typical thing <laughs> that goths and goths friends would do. We would gather around the table, play something and talk and, you know, just shit around for a while. And that is kind of what constitutes a goth in Norway. There's certain bands that were like huge. There's certain types of movies, there's certain types of TV series, and there's a fair chunk of the geek culture that's kind of overlapping with the goth culture, at least it was here in the early 2000s. So now we get into the little list I have made of local resources, resources we had. Meaning, the local resources people in Oslo had. We had, uh, we have an online store, store called uh, Darklands. It's, I think it's a physical store as well, but I might be wrong. And they were based in Kristiansand. Uh, it's in the very south of Norway, so even further south than Oslo. And they used to also have a magazine in Norwegian, which is rare. And they would actually, like, the, the publisher or the people writing for the magazine, they would travel around to things like Whitby Goth Weekend, uh, Wave Gothic Treffen in Germany. Not sure Meraluna was a thing yet. It might have been. Uh, and it seems like while the magazine is now not, no longer available for subscription, you can still get back issues. And I think they kind of just migrate over to being a sort of Facebook page thing or a blog type thing. So you still get like input, but you don't really have the physical, physical magazine. And the magazine is called Rim Frost. And this is actually a pretty good magazine. It's thin, that's the only downside in my opinion. This magazine served as a huge resource for us, a gothy inclined. And they would have like fashion things. And you know. And also, this was a lot of the uh, information uh, hub, kind of, and then you have things like Oslo Goth Meetup Group, and you have the event guides. So this is basically, I'm thinking this is a lot what uh, Angela and the Count was talking about, it's like you had events listed in magazines you can subscribe to, or scenes even you can subscribe to and get sent. And then you would know, like, okay, in like a month there's a big event in that club. So you could plan for it. And like I said, because goth and especially metal in Norway is very much two sides of the same coin. A lot of it is. Uh, this goth magazine would remind people about the Inferno Festival, which is metal. And then you have CDs and, you know, stuff like this. And then we have the uh, purely online store, as far as I know. I couldn't find any information on their website about there being a physical store. It's called uh, Dragon's Hura, which is Norwegian for Dragon's Lair. So I love it. Uh, <laughs> they're based in Tunsbad. Uh, then we had a store 
which is both physical and online, in my hometown. Which is promising, because they have dragons, but... Uh, it's called Valhalla. And... I would say it's... It, basically, it's weapons replicas. It's like swords and knives and battle axes and viking stuff. And I love that kind of stuff. But it's very, very, very little goth stuff. So... I only went in there a few times to look at the dragons and try to save up money for the expensive dragons. Then we have a club in Oslo. As you might remember from the map at the beginning of this video. Gotham Knights. I don't know if they still host events or not. I know they're on Facebook and I know they're active, but I don't know if they uh, host events anymore, if they just promote others who host similar events in and around Scandinavia. So, again, nightclub, I'm too young, it's in Oslo, I live far away. What can you do? And then we have Dark City, which was a club concept. And I say concept because it wasn't, as far as I know, it wasn't a club. It was people who figured we need a goth night. So they would just go and rent a club for a weekend and then throw a big old party and then that was it. But they... I think they're still active through Facebook and things like that, but... It, just few and far between events. I mean, I'm not much of a club goer to begin with, and this is very much a club. Like, you go there to dance. You go there to get shit face drunk and dance. And I don't do that. I might dance, but I don't drink as much anymore. Because reasons. It's a record store called Shadowland in Oslo. Now I live close enough so I can actually go and see the store. But they also. Uh, offered mail order and that was pretty much the only goth and industrial music um, specific store in the whole of Norway. I mean you would get... I, I mean I can easily go to a record store in my city and pick up a record by say Bauhaus. That's not a problem. If there's something newer or more obscure I'm struggling. <laughs> It's... yeah, I'm struggling. So, that was a thing that I never got to experience when I was a teen, because, again, I live far away. And things cost money. Uh, then we get into the um, two still active forums. At least I think they're still active. I've seen recent posts in both. The one... Um, the first one is freak.no forum. This is for everyone. Everyone that's alternative, everyone that's a metalhead, a punk, a emo, goth, industrial kid, techno kid, anything and everything in between. If you're a freak, you're on this forum. And then you have the synth.no forum, which is primarily geared towards the industrial scene. Because at, at the time, and the most known goth music bands that came out of Norway at the time, and still, I think, um, they are synth-based. They are industrial bands. It's like five or six of them that's actually known outside of Norway. And then I found a few that I remember. <laughs> I remember using these when I was a teenager, uh, but they're now not, no longer functioning. They're now defunct. First one being gothic.no. It's a catch-all site for anything gothy. Kind of obvious. Uh, goth City. It was mostly a goth specific forum, like a chat forum. Um, Gothic.no was more like a, if you want to know what goth is, go here first. Um, goth City was like, we are the goths and we talk about shit. <laughs> and they also had something called darkdate.com. You guessed it, it was goth personals, and I had a user. 
but it was the easiest way to get a into contact with other Goths in the country. So while it was set up as a dating forum, think Goth Tinder, but for friends to hang out. Um, we didn't really need to get laid that much, maybe. I don't know. But it was mostly used for a way to get in touch with people. Remember, this was like pre-Facebook, pre-Twitter, pre-everything like that. Uh, this was more or less the only way we can get a hold of a goth, say, live in Bergen. I live in Trondheim, and someone else lives in up in Tromsø. We could all talk in the same chats, or in like interact with the same thing. So that was what it was used for. I guess some people were dating as well, but it wasn't really about that. At least not from my point of view. And none of the people I would talk to were interested in dating anyone. <laughs> it was like, no. No, no. Uh, then we have a club in Bergen called Dominion. I don't know when they opened, I don't know when they closed. I've only been to Bergen once, and that was for about two hours. So I really don't know anything about the scene in Bergen. Uh, then we have the resources I used, which is the meat and bones of this video, because this is what I would do. I mentioned IRC and talking to people. So that was a huge thing. And then we go to Vampire Freaks, which is kind of like, uh, it's like the goth equivalent of MySpace, like from way back in the day. You remember MySpace? Yeah, good times. Uh, <laughs> and it also included a IRC chat room, which I frequented a lot, enough to be an operator for a while. So I would talk to people from all over the world about this goth thing, discover new bands, and discover new fashion trends or whatever, and you know, just normal stuff like we do today, but um, condensed into like one site. The, the biggest one for me at the time, this is going to sound strange, but it was live journal. I had a live journal. I followed people, uh, kind of like the way you would follow any other blog, and you can comment on each other's blog. Kind of like Facebook, in a way, in that sense. And <clears throat> I was very, very lucky, uh, I think, because this was back in like 2002, 2003, or thereabouts. Um, so it was... <sighs> I was talking to people that later became icons in the goth culture. And I also had both Razor Candy and her twin, Eden Prosper, as friends, and their f friends of theirs would also comment sometimes on my comments, like, you know, on Facebook you have a comment thread. It was kind of like the same thing. I also had a few other models on my friends list, and I had a few people who were in bands, such as Marja. Marja? I, I don't really know how to pronounce her name. Uh, then we have, as I mentioned, DeviantArt where I came across Mooncalf, a.k.a. Sophie Campbell, and the Wet Moon comics, which in turn made led me to discover Bella Morte as a band and be obsessed forever since. <laughs> and then, because this is, this is the time before streaming, this is the time before uh, Spotify and, uh, I don't know, Pandora and all these things that you can use today to get a hold of music and discover new music. I had to use, a lot of the time, I had to use torrent sites to get a hold of at least a couple of songs from a band, because if I were to buy a CD or an album, I couldn't buy a digital copy, because that wasn't a thing yet. I had to buy a physical CD. And that typically, I mean, a CD back in those days could be easily like $15 maybe. 
and the problem was that having that CD shipped to my home would be like $20 on top of that. So I was like, let me just download like two or three songs of this album to see if I want to spend like $30, $40 plus on one album from this artist. A lot of the time I did. A lot of the time I ended up buying the CD and the t-shirt and the buttons and you know, that's kind of what happened most of the time, to be honest. But yeah, I also got um, bought a few uh, uh, CDs and T-shirts and things directly from the band because of Live Journal and or Vampire Freaks to some extent, but mostly Live Journal, and that was awesome in my case because they would typically have less shipping costs and the album would be slightly cheaper as well so I could get away with spending like $25 instead of 40 so that was good and then we have a couple of general things uh, gothicsubcultural.com is kind of like the visual goth bible or like virtual rather goth bible it's uh, I used that site a lot when I was in my teens and early 20s because it would tell me all these things about the culture, about all the origins, about the history, about architecture and Victorian things and all these what is goth and it would kind of just break down everything and say that okay here is the scene from the 80s and it includes but not limited to this this and this and these people took influence from this thing from like the 1890s and 1910s not limited to but includes and so on and so forth so it would just continuously expand my knowledge of what this scene entailed uh, that was one of them the other one is let's see deathrock.com and this is mainly because of live journal again um because Especially Razor Candy had already begun doing a lot of modeling when I was, you know, affiliated or connected or whatever you want to call it, when I was following her on Live Journal. Both her and Eden did modeling together at one point. And a lot of the time when Razor Candy was promoting, say, a goth oriented event or a festival or something of that nature, she would wear a band t shirt or uh, like a patch jacket or something with bands on them and a lot of those bands were uh, death rock things and a lot of them were or some of them were psychobilly things so I I ended up researching those things as well and then deathrock.com was the easiest gateway and when I was in my 20s I also subscribed to two magazines for a little while. It's expensive because these are based in the US and shipping shipping to Norway is typically ridiculous. I would subscribe to I think for like a year or something. A year maybe two. So I don't have that many copies of it, but I really love these. Uh, Drop Dead magazine which was this is kind of like uh, general trad goth, I would say. Don't quote me on that because I might be wrong, but based on, you know, I mean, this might as might as well be the original death rock scene for all I know. Because any any link I have to death rock, as such, is through Live Journal, and mainly. Razor Candy and these magazines. So whether or not they would be considered Tradgoth or Death Rock, I cannot tell you. But it's uh I like these magazines. They're kind of I mean they have good quality prints in them. They provide a lot of information, interviews, um, let's see, 
like these things. Band profiles, a short little blurb about each band and the band names and maybe a couple of releases, that sort of thing. That's one of them. And the other one was morely, more aimed directly towards Death Rock. This is Death Rock magazine. So, yeah. And actually, I was friends with her on LiveJournal as well for a while. So, I saw a lot of these pictures on LiveJournal being right before I got the magazine in the, uh, in the mail. So this is Death Rock oriented. Like, so I would watch, like, look through these magazines and be like, I want that. I'm gonna make myself a death hawk. I'm gonna rip up some fishnets and look like this for class in art history. And I did. I, I looked like this for a while. I still didn't call myself a goth, but I looked like something of a hybrid between a goth and a death rocker. <laughs> Those magazines were uh, also a part of a resource I had, but I those came in addition to the internet, uh, or the googling, as I guess I would say, because I only subscribed to the magazines to have something physical that I could kind of read offline, because this was pre-iPad era, and I don't, I don't know if I would want this as an online magazine. I mean, it would be nice to have the information as an online magazine, but half of the point, at least to me, is to have a physical magazine. So yeah, a side note entirely, um, Outland is a comic book store here in Norway, and at least back in the day, when I was growing up, it was as much frequented as, with goths as it was with geeks or nerds. Because it was more or less 50-50 uh, what you would find in the shelves. All these I bought at Outland because they they do a lot of import. So they have like a whole lot of Japanese anime movies in Japanese because for some reason that's not something people stock here in Norway. And they had like the limited edition sets of, say, the Vampire Chronicles by Anne Rice and they had like fancy big editions like the Woodworth, I think it's called, uh, big editions of the Edgar Allan Poe um, writings, uh, stuff like that. And it was more or less 50-50 between that and D&D RPG books <laughs> and other RPG books and Warhammer figures and jewelry. They would stock Alchemy Gothic a lot. And you know, all kinds of stuff. Most of my exposure came through um, Live Journal and talking to people online. And through Live Journal, I once did a tape, tape trade. It was burnt CDs. Um, but I did a tape trade with Maja from, uh, at the time, Dead Fly Ensemble and Skrulls Remains and Cats and Jammer Cabaret. So I discovered quite a few bands through her and I will list in the description bar uh, the bands I discovered through Live Journal, uh, through the tape trade with her and also, you will find a playlist of the music I was already listening to at the time. So, I think... I think I got through everything. I'm sorry if this is a terribly, terribly long and long-winded thing. But I, I wanted to explain how the goth scene in Norway may be somewhat different, if not very different, than what it was or is in the US, or maybe even in England and the UK. And I can only speak for myself and my perspective and what I went through and how I did the things I did and how I found the things I found and, you know, all this stuff. So, 
yes that is all of it like i said you will find more information in the description below bye